Okay, here we are. We're live again on Self Care is My Job. And I have, as usual, these amazing people that crossed my path that I get to have these awesome conversations with. So, hi, this is Jen Haddix, and she's a yoga instructor and a self love coach. And I'm obsessed with this conversation we're about to have. How are <laughs> you doing tonight? I'm doing awesome. How are you doing? Good. Remind us where you are, you know, location wise. In the world. <laughs> I'm in Nevada. In the world. Yeah. So I'm on the West Coast, uh, US in Nevada, in Reno. So not to be confused with Las Vegas, people get very confused. <laughs> yes. How far is that from Vegas? Far. Eight right? hours. So it's pretty far. People yeah. are like, oh, you're right there. I'm like, no, it's a good eight hour drive from Vegas to get to where I'm in the mountains. It's cold. It's awesome. <sighs> I, that's what I was just going to say. I'm like, it's probably freaking beautiful there. Isn't it's it? beautiful. <laughs> yes. It's wonderful here. I mean, there are wonderful things about New Jersey as well, Sure, but they're very different things. <laughs> and East coast and West coast are very different. I've been to New Jersey for the airport. I think that's pretty yeah. much yeah, most just, yeah, where you're going. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, it's true. I mean, if I go to two hours North to, uh, to my in-laws lake house, which is awesome that we have that, you know, I'm, it's, I am, I'm in the mountains and the foliage is beautiful and the air is re more breathable. And it's, so it's, at least I don't have to go far, but yeah, no, I'm right in the thick of it. Right. Very, very close to, uh, to NYC. So yeah. Yeah. Fun <laughs> times. But so I'm really excited to have this conversation with you just for a little background. I, found Jen on Instagram. I know it's, it's like telling, it's like telling, so it's like a couple when they tell, when they tell people, Oh, we met online. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's cheap, exactly it's how bit, but we not really yeah. it's 2021. So yeah. come on. So, um, so, but the thing is though, is that we have such aligned goals and visions around yoga and self-care and specifically self-love. So I mm -hmm. can't wait to have this conversation. This is going to be all about self-love, but not perhaps in the sense that's being, that it's being sold and marketed to us. Right. Yeah. yeah. So we can go there today because it's a lot messier than that. As Jen was just, was just confirming for me that I'm not the only one that feels <laughs> this way. No. So, um, I love it, but what I would really love to know real quick is like, how did you become a yoga instructor and a self-love coach? And you know why? I mean, there's always some inevitable, you know, transition, trans, you know, transformation in life, you know, change that kind of sets you on the path that you're on. Right. So I'm curious, how did we get here? So I'm going to do my best to condense the story. And then anybody who wants to follow me, you'll see a lot more. I, I post all kinds of stuff about my past, but I come from a very traumatic childhood. I was very traumatized as a child. There was a lot of drugs, alcohol. My mom killed herself when I was 24. There's a lot of that kind of stuff going on. And it led into just really interesting coping mechanisms on my part. I did a lot of binge drinking in my twenties, um, a lot of promiscuous sex. Also FYI, I'm super open and I will not help hold back anything. So hopefully it's not too TMI for your audience. Mm -hmm. but I will tell all the things. <laughs> um, so I was just, you know, really not taking very good care of myself, really unaware of the subconscious beliefs that I had. And I got into competitive bodybuilding about six or seven years ago. And because I also have an array of eating disorders. There was just all kinds of crap going on. And I was so unaware of what was actually driving me. And I just thought, you know, things are happening to me. I'm such a victim. Everything is hard. And it's because of my childhood and I was blaming it and all that. I got into this bodybuilding competition and it kind of turned my world upside down because I dieted myself down and I got on stage and I did the whole thing. And I'd never felt so empty in my entire life. Like I'd never felt so unfulfilled or so small and it kind of sent me into a tailspin. I got diagnosed bipolar. I went on medication and I was just at my lowest low. And then like, I feel like it happens for a lot of people that I've met a teacher of some kind or a mentor or somebody walks into your life and kind of pulls you out of the mud. And so for me, that was my homeopath, Barbara, who kind of fills the part of mom. And we are still connected deeply to this day. And it was just like a light switch Although it did take years and years of healing after that, which is what we're going to get into in, into this podcast is all the messy crap I went through to really get to where I am and the messy crap I continue to go through to continue to peel back the layers. But she came into my life. We did a lot of healing, got off of meds. Um, and I got certified to teach yoga back in 2016. I didn't start teaching until 2018 and that alone, teaching other people, those healing modalities, you will 
inevitably heal yourself through healing other people. And I learned that. And then this year I quit drinking. Um, I got a download from source on January 9th that said no more drinking. And I was like, cool. (laughs) And it literally has not been a problem since. And I had kind of a drinking problem. So I was surprised that it was so easy and I actually love being sober. So that's kind of the very super condensed version of all of my craft that kind of got me to here today. And so I just realized how important self-love is and not necessarily in the form of self-care because I believe that they are different. Mm -hmm. Self-care is a tool to increase self-love and increase self-awareness. And that's kind of where I'm at today. Oh my goodness. First of all, that was an amazing job at, at, you know, condensing your very big story into something that we can digest, but at the same time, giving us the real deal. So I appreciate that. And that's, you know, what I talk about all the time on this show is kind of like, we really need to just open up to each other and be more vulnerable with each other. If we don't talk about our struggles, then how will it be normalized to have struggles? Like it doesn't make any sense. (laughs) Absolutely. So, um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot that I could say about that, but it's true. The fact that there's always somebody that like kind of pops in and helps you to shine a light on those demons, on those shadows that, um, you know, and might not deliberately enter and say, I am here, right? Like, you know, not like present themselves in that way, but sometimes it can just be like one thing that a, a spiritual teacher or somebody even just in your life says to you that kind of shifts your perspective. Um, when you said that, I was thinking about the first coach that I ever worked with. And one of the first things after me, you know, vomiting all of my life goals onto her in our first session and just being like, I don't know what to do with this. I just know that there's more, right. Or like, I want more kind of, kind of situation. Um, and she looked at me and she said, but I don't understand mom. Cause I have two kids. I don't understand mom. Listen to me. I don't understand <laughs> Sam. She said, do you want to be a stay at home mom? Or do you want to be a working mom? And, or like, you know, like, what is it that you really want? And I swear I must've turned purple because those labels and the fitting in of the boxes were such a trigger for me that I really couldn't answer the question. Right. Mm -hmm. I didn't know because in my head, especially going back, that's going back years at this point in my head, I was still very attached to keeping that label of stay at home mom, because it gave me a big old badge of honor. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, look, this is, this is, this is what makes me enough right now. So if I take that piece away and then I go down this road of entrepreneur and doing things for myself, then I have to relinquish my badge of honor and I have to do things for me that things that are very explicitly only for me to get there. So, um, it was like this moment of, I don't know what to do with these emotions, but it was the labeling that I, at that point in time, had to dive in so hardcore into and understand why I was feeling this urge to fit into a certain box and how I needed to let that shit go. If I was going Mm -hmm. to actually ever feel enough as I am to feel like I could actually be myself fully and authentically and do the things that I want to do without, you know, second guessing myself at every move. Right. Um, so I think that that kind of is a lead in to what we're talking about today, which is like, okay, it's messy. You can't just turn the, you know, switch a light on and say, okay, I love myself. And then there's also a lot out there. Um, there's a lot of like mindset stuff, you know, like curbing your negative self-talk, things like Mm -hmm. that that are all like well and good and are important, but it does like, once you do, I remember being in therapy, right. Which I still am in therapy and I still love my therapist, another like person who turned it around. Right. Mm -hmm. And she said, write down all of the, um, yeah, like negative thought patterns about yourself that come into your mind like on a daily basis like just jot them down when they come in because I had gotten to a point where I could actually be aware that I was going down that road of like telling myself oh you're not good enough for that or whatever it is right I mean I filled like three pages it was Mm -hmm. crazy Mm -hmm. and I didn't even real you don't realize until you shine a light on this shit so I don't know if you've ever had an experience like that where like you go from totally 
like blindsided to to what to how much damage you're doing to your inner child really in a in a when you really think about it with all those thoughts to oh my god like look at look at what like what I could let go what I could release and then where you where you can go from there well I think that's really powerful first what you said about the box and about how the badge of honor was being a stay-at-home mom and I think that that's something I've come to realize about the self-love and about teaching it to other people and teaching it to myself is that we all have labels that we put on ourselves that we think inherently gives us self-worth because we don't have that inherent self-worth within us because we don't even know what that looks like. And so what I, what you're saying about having that light shown on those negative things, we live in a society that teaches us to push down emotions. It says, you know, you, you don't want to feel your feelings, go ahead and drink, go ahead and do this, go distract yourself, go do anything you can to just get away from the bad feelings. But the shadow self, that side is where all the healing is. And so I think it's really powerful. The reason you are where you are is because you sat down with someone and you were, and I think it's important that you were in a safe place Mm -hmm. to write down all of those things. Because if you're alone on this journey and you're like, okay, I'm going to sit down and write down all the negative thoughts I have, and you're by yourself and no one's holding space for you, that's a recipe for a dark, dark hole. That's a, you know, so I think that it's really powerful that you sat down with someone that you can trust. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a therapist. It can be a coach. It could be like my homeopath. It could be a family member you trust, that's kind of tough because it can be a little loaded with family, but that's, you know, that is one of those things that it's, we shy away from the work, but the minute you sit with that stuff, the minute you actually look at it and realize that you're not a horrible person, that you're not going to die from recognizing your shadow self is when you start to find the healing. So I think that mine probably wasn't quite as cute, like all in one time, writing down all those things. I think that I (laughs) might've crawled right back into my hole and put meds in my mouth. I would have been like, nope, I can't do it. Cause I was kind of suicidal at that time. But over the years, I have just had the opportunity to go, okay, well, this is an area of my life that I'm ready to look at because I had so much trauma that if I did it all at once, I don't know that I would have been able to handle it. But like this year I worked on the alcohol thing, which was a big deal for me. And I had to be ready for it. And I also worked on my love life, which has also been, that's a whole long story about how terrible that's been based on my trauma. And I told source, Hey, I'm ready to look at this. I'm ready to look at the things that I'm doing that are causing me to feel this way. And that are causing me to keep, keep inviting in the same experiences that are not bringing me joy. And once I did that, once I decided a man entered my life, who is able to work with me and help me and be my partner. And that I never thought was possible for me. So I've, I've personally taken sort of like a a piecemeal approach to it. I think it's different for everybody. Mm -hmm. So I, but yeah, that's kind of how my experience with that sort of piece of this has been. Yeah. And the, yeah, I mean, not to say that I tackled all those things at once. (laughs) I didn't mean to assume that you did. Like you're like, okay, there's the list. Now let's see what we do with it. That would have been problematic. Let's just, let's (laughs) just leave it at that. Um, but yeah, we just, just, uh, creating awareness that wasn't there before. And you said something that's so spot on that I talk about all the time. The fact that we're taught to numb ourselves out, like we're taught. And I think it, it kind of goes back to, right. Like an old way of parenting that hopefully is like cycling, cycling out now. I mean, I'm experiencing it because I have two small kids and at every friggin' turn, I'm always like, like, you know, like I'll catch myself being like, Oh, like I can't be like that authoritative parent who is cutting off my emotional self to them for the purpose of keeping them in a box Mm -hmm. of man, keeping them manageable, you know, like quiet your fucking kids down, you know, like that type of stuff. But it, but it's more than that. It's more than quiet your kids down. It's like, why are they so much, you know, kind of thing. And, you know, there's a line that we have to kind of walk and we have to guide them to what's, I don't want to, I don't even want to say appropriate, but not to make this a parenting conversation, but I feel like that put, get it fitting in the boxes and, and getting, of course, we get our then validation as children back Mm -hmm. when we fit in the box, when we are quiet and we, when we are seen, but not heard or heard, but not seen. What? No, Mm -hmm. other way. (laughs) Second guessing myself again. So, um, and when we also fall in line with like what the rest of our family is like and does, I remember that being a major, 
major light bulb for me. Um, I had to tackle why I was having such anxiety um, around being with one particular family member all mm -hmm. the time. And what I realized was that for the longest time, this person was put on a pedestal in our family being the first male heir, <laughs> heir, <laughs> the first male child do that. <laughs> in the family. I'm like, I don't know why, but it feels that way. <laughs> so, um, you know, sort of always having this pressure to fall in line with like what he was like, right? So I had to tackle that because it was just another example of ways that I was trying to fall in line with what the rest of my family was doing and saying and acting like and what they look at as cool and great and wonderful versus how who I really, really fucking was. Um, so I always go back to that because once you're you're we're, we're programmed from so young to get our validation and our approval and our acceptance and how we feel loved and we feel worthy mm -hmm. from fitting in these boxes. Um, and it's, it's problematic, but, and, and then in addition to that being told that those hard feelings and emotions that arise when we don't want to fit in the box or when <laughs> we, we just can't or whatever it is, we have to numb those also and mm -hmm. run from any form of discomfort. So not only are we programmed from the start to really morph really in a way is what I normally say, we're morphing, right? 100%. But we're also told, and anytime that feels uncomfortable, run from discomfort at any turn. But this work of this unraveling that we're talking about right now, mm -hmm. from what's supposed to be to what always has been, right? Yep. Is so beautiful because it's called, we call it work. Right. And I've been talking about this lately. Yes, it's work, but it's like beautiful work. I feel like it, you know, like it gets a bad rep because it's like, you know, it makes it almost like more of a draw for some people to be like, I can't go there. Mm -hmm. Right. But mm -hmm. it's like this beautiful unraveling. It feels like to me. And it has these hard moments of, like I said, like just staring straight into discomfort and walking right toward it. Um, but I don't know if you, yeah, I don't know if you've experienced that too, like sort of in people who you work with or even with yourself as far as it being hard, but also like so rewarding, obviously on the other end of it, right? Well, I want to go back real quick to what you were saying where you're like, I don't want to make this a parenting conversation, but I think actually, so full disclosure, I am not a parent, mm -hmm. but you can actually make this a parenting conversation because anybody who is listening is very, very capable of reparenting themselves. And that's something I talk about a lot because I have like a module in my coaching where I do a lot of inner child work. Mm -hmm. And so many of us, I mean, like you said, there's old styles of parenting with the authoritative, put you in a box, make sure you be seen, not heard, all of that stuff. And we are, we were raised by unhealed parents who were raised by their unhealed parents who were raised by their, so it's just this lineage of no healing. And we're getting closer to it now because we're more awake and we're paying attention, but we're like, oh my God, look at all that shit that happened to me back then. How do I heal that? And a lot of it is kind of looking within and sitting with your inner child and reparenting them. And what you were saying about like with your kids, like there's a fine line. And I really wish there wasn't because can you imagine if all of us were born and we were allowed to be the fullest expression of ourselves, the world would be a very different place. And so mm -hmm. we're currently, this is something else that's part of my platform. I talk a lot about breaking the matrix and you can take that however you want, but really to me, society is the matrix, the nine to five, the make sure you do all the right things to get the house, to get married, to do all that stuff. We teach that to our kids because we want them to be accepted and we want them to fit in, in society. But we are currently right now, I believe in a place where that's breaking on a global level, the entire matrix matrix is breaking. There's so many of us online that are like, fuck all the regular stuff. We're not doing any of it. We're not participating. And so can we give that to our children and also give it to ourselves as adults. And I think that that's really powerful. So anything you're learning in parenting, I think is really going to be powerful, even for the adults listening who don't have kids, because I think that that is one, maybe not disservice, but possibly what we chose to be here for, to be here in this time to break through all of this and relearn who we actually are. So then full circle to the unraveling. Yes, 100%. That's how I see it. I see it very much as like, fuck, that was hard. That was really uncomfortable. But how beautiful is it? The things that are coming out of it, like the things that I'm seeing, the things that I'm creating that I just never thought were possible only came 
to be because of my discomfort. And any personal development person, any book you read is going to tell you that the successful people, the enlightened people are very comfortable with getting uncomfortable on a consistent basis. Do you feel like yoga is a practice that allows you to get comfortable with being uncomfortable in to- yeah. at times? Do you? I do. Totally. I mean, yeah. it's like almost like rhetorical, right? Like, right. do you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, do, do you? <laughs> but uh, something tells me you do. Um, so yeah, I'll often go there with my students and my clients and just say, you know, this isn't about being flexible in your body. <laughs> this is about being flexible in not only your nervous system, I'll go there sometimes, right? But mm-hmm. also like in your soul, because you can't fit in this box anymore. You gotta, you gotta get out, you gotta break out. So we gotta break up all of this tension and we have to get used to taking up space and the discomfort that you feel like, say, when you are in a pose for a period of time for, you know, two minutes, you know, say something like that, or say seven breaths or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. There's often, I always compare, right? Like there's often maybe at the beginning when you first get into a position, right? It feels good. And then once you sit, it starts to get a little uncomfortable, it starts to get a little tense. And, um, and even if it's not in your body, say you're like totally like, you know, very open and, and you got a lot of mobility and everything, you'll want to run away because you don't want to sit, sit still for that long. We're literally, and that's, you know, you're talking about the matrix and the society that we're living in. We unfortunately are really pitted up against this sort of problematic issue of wanting to be, have constant gratification and on to the next and on to the next with social mm-hmm. media, with all the technology and just with like general patriarchal um, approach to always doing, always producing, you know, going, 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 doing, doing, doing. So again, this is not anybody's fault. Like if you feel like, oh, I can't, I can't, you know, like, why do I get so uncomfortable? you know, just for the listeners who are like, yeah, like I can't sit still and I am shitting on myself for it. Like, this is not your fault, but back to the parenting conversation, not even just parenting the, the, um, breaking of cycles and breaking of this matrix that needs to continue to happen. It might not be our fault that we got here, but it is our responsibility that is my fear. I say that all the time. Like what happened to you is not your fault, but healing is your responsibility. Yeah. And you want to run, right? You want to run away from that responsibility because you've been taught to be fearful. That's part of the matrix. But the sooner we accept it and the sooner we just get ready to get uncomfortable, the sooner we're going to be out of this. And I think that that's on a global collective scale. We're struggling with that right now. Yeah. So connecting the dots because self-love is like a buzzword, right? So let's like, because we're talking about healing. We're talking about a healing journey really essentially right now, but how the two are connected. And I'll say this, and then you can tell me in your own words, but it's like how we unravel ourselves from this fitting in of the boxes and, and falling in with this system that was presented to us as what everything is supposed to be like. Mm -hmm. How when, as we unravel from that, we can come closer and closer and closer to our authentic self, our true essence, the person that we were always, you know, like I have, I have a belief, you know, further than that, I have a belief that, um, that we all like know somewhere deep inside of us, that there's that inner child, there's, there's that person that we've forgotten, right. That, and, and these values and these, these, um, desires and skills even and talents and all these things that we just put on a shelf and we've left it and it's collected dust but we know it's there I think everybody knows it's there um so yeah it's like right it's like my hope and joy and and goal to wake up the world to like Mm -hmm. remember remember who the f you are right Mm -hmm. so the more we unravel from all the bullshit 
the closer and closer we go inward. And I, the one thing that I've known that I've loved in uh, that I learned from my therapist is talking about this, this healing journey being like a spiral because you're kind of going around this spiral inward, getting closer and closer to your true self, your true essence, right? Like remembering that. But what I love about that too, is that we have to be prepared to address some of the same lessons over and over and over again. Again, we're not just flipping off a light switch on each of these negative patterns. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work like that. Um, I have, I've gotten to a point where I see, you know, like maybe like, you know, something, something's coming. I have hard emotions for like two days, right. Around something. And then after maybe like a day and a half or two days, I start to notice why it's coming, you know, or I start to realign with what it is that it's the same shit I dealt with, you know, six months ago or whatever it is, it's coming back up again. It's a little bit easier to navigate this time because I have a level of awareness that I didn't have before. Um, but at the same time, it's always coming up again for a reason. Mm -hmm. And the reason could be, well, obviously one reason is I'm not fucking done with that one yet, (laughs) 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 but it's also, um, you know, in many cases, this is the last thing I'll say in many cases, it is, it becomes apparent to me that it needed to come up again for me so that I could help somebody else with it. Mm -hmm. Who's a little bit further outward on that spiral. Yes. And I love that idea of the spiral. I love the idea of like almost like a revolving door. Like here it is again. Oh, but you know what? I actually know a little bit more about it this time. So I'm going to be able to help myself or help somebody else. And then from a yoga perspective, the coil, the Kundalini at the base of the spine, that's all very much by design, I believe. And I think, and that is something that I actually shy away from Kundalini because it feels too intense and scary for me. Cause I know how my, your eyes say it all. It's a scary <laughs> practice. You're like, oh, fuck. Like it's a scary practice. Um, but everything you said, that's exactly how I feel about it is um, I always, I've been saying lately that self-love is source love. And that's exactly what you're saying is coming back to center, coming back to who you really are and who we all really are is source. And especially right now, when we are seeing so much bad in each other, the bad you see in each other is the bad you feel about yourself. And so it's a mirror back to you of the things that you feel about yourself. And so if you do not heal those things, you are going to continue to see bad things in the world. And then we're going to just project our unhealed crap onto each other. And that's kind of how we got to where we are. That and the matrix is all kind of how we are, where we are. So this self-love work, and that's where we, we were kind of getting at when we started the conversation before we started the podcast is self-care and self-love are two very different things. And I believe that self-care, you see that everywhere. And I think that self-love, the buzzword is doing the self-care thing. So it's like self-care is bubble baths and yoga and meditation and taking care of yourself and taking time for yourself and going for walks in nature. All of that is self-care. It is also a tool for self-love. Meditation can increase self-love based on peeling back the layers and unraveling and yoga can get you uncomfortable. Like you said, which was beautiful and contribute to the unraveling. But what self-love really is, I think is looking at the shadow self and very slowly holding space for yourself to just forgive all the shadow shit because you want to get rid of it. You want to let, you want to push it away. You don't want to look at it, but if you can go, wow, like you'll hear, if you ever listen to my podcast, I will tell all the stories about all the horrible shit that I've done and the things that I look at where I'm like, I've hurt people. I've done all these things. And if I can look at those things and go, you know what, Jen, I forgive you because you're not that person anymore. And you had to go through A, B and C to get here. That to me is the self-love work. And I don't know if that really answered your question, but that's no, where I would say that doesn't matter. It's beautiful. (laughs) Nonetheless. Um, I'm not sure I even remember my question, but yeah. Yeah, So, um, yeah, that is, it's so important to note all of this. Yeah. And the, you, so relationships is what started to come in as you were talking Mm -hmm. your relationship to yourself and your relationship with the people around you are affected when you go, when you take steps to heal yourself. So obviously your relationship to your, I think that's where the support that you were talking about earlier and doing this with a coach, doing this with a therapist, having somebody to hold space for you. The reason that we experience trauma in the first place that led us, I, I threw the T word in, but anyway, so the reason that we 
have this trauma that we need to heal from is because we is because we dissociated from our true essence because Mm -hmm. of a, not even just because of like specific experiences, because like, for example, your experiences are very different than mine, mm-hmm. but some of our, some of the way that it manifests on, at the, on the other end of it could be similar. But that being said, either way, when there is that lack of safety and space held for you to actually process through all of it, when mm-hmm. it's happening, or maybe just even after it's happened at any point, you cannot, you cannot do any of that without a safe space. So I was thinking about relationships because I feel like a lot happens, right? When you start to unravel and new aspects of yourself start to emerge that have been maybe buried um, or, you know, just because they didn't fit into the realm of your family, they didn't fit into what was supposed to be. So, I mean, for me, I know I got a lot of, you know, I still to this day, I get a lot of literal and figurative eye rolling, you know, Uh, where it's like, you know, there she goes again. She's got to talk about all, all this stuff. Like we got to go there on everything. And that's how I've always been. Mm -hmm. That's who I've always been. Uh, You know, I remember as a kid, there were eye rolls and it was like, what is she, you know, three going on 30 you know, Mm -hmm. type of thing. And, and, and it was because I had questions. I was curious, but then also as I learned more about this sort of, about all of this, um, yeah, about, about things that happened to us in childhood, generational trauma, ways that we dissociate from ourselves and all of this, I realized more and more that I've actually always known this. I've always known that this, you know, that our, our childhood experiences and everything leading us to kind of want to fall in line, you know, stay in your lane and, or, and who do you think you are mentality, right? Mm -hmm. I've always known that it's the one, you know, biggest thing that's leading us so far off track. So as I learn more and more, not only do I heal, do I unravel, do I, am I able to let my, you know, light shine a little brighter? But it's happy and also sad sometimes because I go and, you know, back to what I was saying about how everybody, I think everybody knows that there's this person inside of them that's very lost and lonely and is waiting for them to come home. And that's how it feels for me. It's like being, you know, the healer comes out of me now because it's who I've always, who I was always supposed to be. And I felt, I was told that was way weird and too much. Right. So we had to shove that away. Mm -hmm. And then, so when it comes out, it's like, oh, God damn, you've always known that it's happy, both happy and sad, but it's like this beautiful kind of combo of emotions with that. (laughs) Beautiful beautiful though. Yeah. And you brought up something really good. I think I just want to touch on it real quick is the relationship thing, because like you said, you've got people that even now figurative or literal eye rolling. So you might be surrounded by some people that are not quite ready for your new vibration or your new, your new understanding of your true self. And something I hear a lot from clients and just people who want to do this work is not being accepted by the people in their life. And that is the hardest part because they're, you're going to lose some people. I have lost a lot of people and the right, the right people will stick around and they still may not understand you. There are people that are maybe non-negotiable for you, certain family members, but you kind of learn how to navigate them and without compromising who you are. And, but a lot of people, you, you teach people how to treat you. And if you're at your lower self or your less understood self, I don't want to say lower self, but your less understood version of yourself, you are allowing people to do all kinds of things that your higher self will not allow. So then when you start to create that space for yourself and you start to unravel and you start to see who you are, people are like, Whoa, you're changing. And I don't like it. And I don't like who you are now. And you're different. And that makes you want to crawl right back into that box so that everybody accepts you. And so that is one of the other main reasons to have someone to hold space for you because it is hard shit to do by yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, completely. I have, I'm extremely lucky that as, you know, for, for as many people as I have that are slowly falling away and, or still judging me, Mm -hmm. I have just as many people in, in any given moment that I could say anything to. Good. And you know what I mean? But, and I didn't, didn't necessarily even know that. And you won't really know that until you, until you start speaking your truth, you won't Mm -hmm. know, you won't know. Um, 
some people might surprise you as well. Right. Absolutely. Which is also another beautiful experience when you're like, Oh, fuck. I had, I have a very, very close friend that, you know, when I started just sharing all of my experience with her and especially when I started talking about, you know, like my, my how I feel about my relation or my place in the bigger scheme of things mm -hmm. and my connection to source, as you were saying, and my sort of purpose and so on and so forth. It was like, oh my God, Sam, I have been waiting for you to talk to me about this. Like, you know what I mean? Oh, like really? I have been waiting for you to be ready for like this conversation, you know? So um, like I said, some people might surprise you. So I, I'm saying it to the listeners, right? Like yeah. don't feel like opening up and letting your, your light shine is going to just be like blinding everyone around you. Um, it's also going to attract new people into your life who, especially, you know, like just to dip our toes in that, right. <laughs> like as far as we're, what we're attracting, um, your vibration will literally be so elevated even by taking, I don't mean, I wouldn't even say, okay, once you, you know, really feel like you're getting back to yourself and like your inner child isn't angry and sad and upset with you and quite so much anymore. And, you know, kind of thing. And you're rebuilding that relationship with yourself. Um, your vibration starts to really start to attract new people and new relationships into your life. And I would, I would go as far as saying that it happens. Like as soon as you take action on anything towards that, Right. Like, I don't know if you agree with that. Right. Like, like as soon as there's action taken in that direction, it's like the universe responds and is like, here's an opportunity for you to either learn uh, about yourself from a situation or to learn from this person or this relationship. It's like, absolutely agree with that. Yeah. And thank you for bringing that up. Cause I know I kind of took that into a negative place because you were going to lose people, but you're 100% going to attract new people. So don't, don't be afraid if someone is going to fall away and whatever, because they, we have this tendency to, to hold on to people tightly. Like there's never going to be another one of them, or like, we're never going to meet people like that again, or we need to keep them because that's just part of the matrix. That's part of what we think keeps us safe, but know that when you loosen your grip, you invite so many things that you can't even imagine in. Yeah. It's so, it's so necessary. Um, yeah. So I'm going to take this conversation back inward for a moment. So we go, we go down this, you know, road of, like you said, like healing, uh, reparenting. I love that concept. A lot of us have heard of the concept of like your inner child. Um, I'm wondering from your perspective, uh, what you, I don't want to, I don't want to say suggest, but what some of your favorite practices are in those realms, right? Like to litter, to come home to yourself, to find that person that's been like kind of dormant for so long. So for, as far as like literal inner child work, I do, um, I like to, I'm not very good at visualization. So I tend to hang out with pictures. So I'll use pictures of like me and my mom when I was little. So I get a little bit of that visual and maybe I'll sit down and ask her what she needs. I imagine like little Jen sitting on my lap and I'm like, okay, Jen, like, what is it that you need right now? Because I was, there's a lot that happened that I didn't get because my mom was very sick. And so I'm like, okay, what did I need back then that is actually permeating my adult experience now? How can I actually sit down and give that to her? And then another thing is catching myself in the moments. Like when, so I always say that this journey begins with awareness and it's funny because then you start to be aware and you start to get really frustrated with yourself because you're so aware, but you're not quite sure yet how to fix the things that you're aware of. And so you bring that awareness into your experience and you start to notice the places where you have reactions or the places where you feel triggered or the places where you feel, um, victimized. And those are the spots where you could use some reparenting. And those are the spots where you can for me, I have to slow down a lot. Coaches, I've had several coaches, therapists, whatever. One of my biggest notes is always slow down because I grew up in chaos and I grew up in action and reaction. And so I always have to slow down and go, okay, I want to do this, but let me sit down with myself, maybe parent myself for a moment and give myself the opportunity to make a different choice. And sometimes I fail. Sometimes I still do the same reaction. I do the same behavior, but the more you do it, the more it starts to make sense. So I feel like 
one of the most powerful things we can do is just cultivate awareness and start to kind of catch ourselves in the moments where we're having the hardest times and just try our best to make different choices. And then always remember, would you talk to a child the way that you talk to yourself? That's one of my biggest ones. Would you ever sit down and tell a child they were stupid or they were fat or they were not enough or that their creation sucked? You would never do that, but we do it to ourselves on the daily. And so that's a really good place to start too. Yes. I feel (laughs) like, you know, we, there's, it's part of the story, right? It's part of the system that's presented to us is like, okay, so once you're 18 or over, you're now an adult and now you are no longer a child. So you really don't need any real nurturing anymore. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, Mm -hmm. or whatever the age is or whatever, you know, whatever the time frame is, it's like, this concept of child and adult. I mean, I think that so many people would agree with, agree with me that you could be in your thirties or forties and still feel like a fucking kid. Uh huh. And the, you know, maybe you don't feel like you look like a kid, but you feel like how the hell, you know, like, how do, how do I got two kids already? Like, you know, like <laughs> how, I'm a, I'm a kid. Why do how the fuck do I have two kids? Like, you know, I mean, yeah. literally I think it's all bullshit. Because you get to this, you, you, okay, fine. So you have all these experiences, right? And so you have knowledge, ideally, that you didn't have before. But that doesn't mean that you don't need nurturing, that you mm-hmm. don't need parenting. It's just that you need to do it for yourself. Yes. So I think that's really kind of, right, that perfect culmination of like self-love and self-care. Like 100%. you have the self-care practices because you need to nurture yourself to bring back, you know, to, to elevate your self-love and just something that came up when you were, when you were talking too, is that we're trying to like come home to ourselves. We're not trying to fix ourselves, right? Like we're not there. We're not broken. We're not broken. We're not all fucked up. We're not a hot mess. You know, we're not any of that. It's just, this is the hand we've been dealt. Mm -hmm. And like we said before, it's our, it's our responsibility to ourselves and potentially yes, to future generations, Mm -hmm. but mostly to ourselves to unravel from that and to come back and reconnect with our true essence. It's so necessary. I always talk about, there's so many things that we can do and, you know, I'll tell you yoga, I can go down so many roads of why it will lead you back in. Right. Mm -hmm. But also I feel like everybody has like a, um, like a skill or a talent or a hobby or a pastime or something that just makes them light up a little bit that they've put somewhere in a shelf and never go back to. One of the things for me, um, in recent years has been music. And that was always like, right. Like also being judged for not have not, you know, my vocals, not being, you know, I'm always feeling like I need to sound before you would even like open before I'd even open my mouth. I better sound like Celine Dion because it better not come out. Anything less than that is crap. Right. So I'm guessing you've done lots of auditions, right? Yeah. I mean, I do mostly of my own stuff, but yeah. And that should all either way, it doesn't even matter. Putting yourself out there in any way is this like, that's major action. Mm -hmm. You're sending so much like messages outward and then it comes back to you, but it's also coming back to something that sparked you as a child or as a young adult, or at some point in your life that made, that gave you that, that creativity that made you feel connected to your truth. And like, almost like it was something that you always had, right. Mm -hmm. Bringing something like that back. I always talk about it because you know that it just gets put on a shelf and you never make time for it yeah um so that's been instrumental for me these practices these self-care practices that are a tool as we said like you said that like for you to go into something that makes you feel so vulnerable and so seen and also so powerful because i i think too i don't know if we talked about that in our dms but that's i I don't think we did (laughs) oh yes i we have so many things aligned but that's like a really that's something that I do all the time for myself. And I'm in a, like an acapella group with my friends and we just, you know, I used to do musical theater, that sort of thing. And I want to incorporate it into my yoga. I started chanting and doing more singing in my yoga, but like, 
it is a very vulnerable thing. And a lot of people that are listening, maybe when you were a kid, you like to paint or you like to do little plays for your parents, or you like to do anything that you did. We were taught, okay, well, that's fun, but you can't make money at that. So you better get a nine to five and you better get insurance and you better, I haven't had insurance in 15 years. I don't participate in the medical system. I don't want your insurance. I don't want, I don't want whatever they're selling. So like, but we learned that depending on how your parents were, it was like, well, you better get security. Well, you know what? The world is not a secure place. And you, the only security you have is within yourself. So don't you want to spend your time on earth actually cultivating whatever it is? And chances are the closest you were to that was when you were a kid cultivating that real light within yourself is when you were little and you weren't told who to be yet. And you had something that you liked to do for me. I was always singing the same as you. Um, I'm not a very good artist. I tried, but <laughs> you know, but you've had these things. And even if you don't know, maybe you sit down and you just start drawing or you dance around or you move your body and try to just be playful. We lose that. And like you said, we're not adults magically when we're 18, I'm 36. And I feel like a child sometimes like it's not. Totally. And so you get playful and, you know, my boyfriend and I, he wanted to paint the other day. He's like, I've got these canvases. I can't paint, but let's just paint some stuff. And it was horrible, but we had fun. We just painted and we were like, cool. That was great. It was like a nice, I don't know, connection to that. And so I don't know for your listeners, can you, can you play? That's where, that's really where it is, is playtime. And like you said, I'm not against the patriarchy, but I do think that the patriarchal structure is bigger than the matriarchal structure right now. It's a lot of do, do, do. We've got a lot of masculine energy. We need masculine, but we also really need feminine. We are taught not to rest. We are taught not to play. We are taught to just work ourselves into the ground. And that's where I think we're coming to a corner right now. I think we're changing and I think we're realizing that we can actually play and do more if we're feeling more joyful. And that's where the, the yin and the yang and the matriarchy and the patriarchy kind of come together to help us have both. Yeah, exactly. I agree a hundred percent. We need it all and we can have it all. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. Like we're told that, you know, yeah, that it's about producing and doing, you know, I always say in my classes, right? Like we're human beings. We're not human doings there's a reason that that's what we're called. That's our species. We can be. <laughs> and yeah. So, the, and the only thing I'll throw in too, cause you said it before, as far as that awareness, like cultivating that awareness. Yeah. You know, aside from bringing in your creativity and your play too, the simplest thing that you can do is slow the fuck down. <laughs> Not like 100%. <laughs> slow down, start axing stuff off your to-do list and create a little bit of space for yourself. But even, even if you feel like you can't do that right now, just slow down in everything that you're doing. I just took, I just took the whole summer to like, literally like become a slug. Like I was like, it was so, you know, cause with the kids being off from school and everything, I was like, I I'm probably not going to be accomplishing that much anyway. So I'm going to literally use this as an opportunity to really feel what it's like to set some new boundaries, say no to things, relax, do exactly what we want to do and do Mm -hmm. it, you know, one thing at a time, one step at a time. And it was magical. And I downloaded an entire new, like, a, you know, an entire new like journey in my business and in my offering just from the slowing down. So in other words, the doing feels like that's the only way that we get anywhere. Right. But if we slow down, we can actually hear and see things that we couldn't, we weren't, we didn't have access to before. And I'm going to lean into that. I love that so much. And so that's like, if we want to take it full circle yoga and meditation are a really beautiful way to do that. And I know even if you're new to yoga, you don't feel flexible, whatever, it doesn't matter. What it teaches you to do is to slow down and pay attention and listen. Like you said, there's things that you're not, you don't have access to until you slow the fuck down and stop doing stuff. Because if you're doing all the time, I think about this a lot because in like our modern day with technology and all the distractions, like Back in the day when people had a sitting room where they just sat there and they thought that's where ideas were born. That's where things came from. Like we didn't have to like poop with a phone in our hand. There was no TV in the, in the room. Mm -hmm. You just sit there and think and just be with your thoughts and then ideas happen. And so that's another thing back to the parenting thing. Like kids are allowed to be bored because that's when they come up with stuff. And that's when they come up with beautiful things. And we are also allowed to be bored. We're allowed to be undistracted and we should be because that's when we come up with the best ideas for how we can express ourselves. 
Completely, completely allow space for that. Right. So beautiful. Listen, this has been an amazing conversation. I am immensely grateful to you for connecting with me and for reaching out. So just real quick, tell us where we can find you online. And we're going to make sure that we can put that in the, in the description of the show as well. Awesome. And thank you for having me. This has been really, really fun. I love it so much. Um, so yeah, I'm on Instagram at the self yogi. I had another account, but it got deleted and now I can't get that name back. So the self yogi, and then you can go to my website, which is self And I've got all kinds of stuff on there. I've got a couple of freebies, like a free little mini workbook, a little self love bingo. I've got all kinds of yoga videos. I've got low end offers to high end offers, all kinds of different ways that you can work with me and that I can help you. And I love to hang out in my DM. So if you want to send me a message and have a little chat, I love to see how I can be of service to people. So just come hang out with me on there. And then I also have a podcast, the self-love yoga podcast. Perfect. I just went on Spotify and followed that right before I got on here. I was like, Oh wait, let me save this. I'm going back. (laughs) This is amazing. Thank you so much again. And if you're listening and you love this conversation, just don't forget to pop on to either Spotify or Google or Apple, wherever you get your podcast and follow self-care is my job. We're also on YouTube, uh, self-care is my job, YouTube channel. So you could subscribe there if you'd like to see our beautiful faces and that is all. Thank you so much again. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much.